Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having an incredible day today. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday season. Today we're going to be covering another case for my 12 days of Christmas. I'm doing a case every day for 12 days until Christmas, which I really hope that you guys are enjoying. And let's just go ahead and jump straight into the case. Today we're going to be talking about the Lawson family murders and this is a crazy case even though there's not like a humongous amount of information because this happened, like it's a pretty old case, it happened all the way back in the 1920s. Charlie Lawson, he was the father of the family, he was born in 1886 to Augustus and Nancy Lawson in, wait for it, Lawsonville. <laughs> Is my even broken that I find that funny? The Lawsons in Lawsonville. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, sorry. Anyway, Lawsonville is in North Carolina and it's like this tiny little working class town. Like even today, there's only just over a thousand people that live there. And this is where he met Fanny Manring and they got married in 1911 and goodness me, they had eight children. That is a lot of babies running around. Come to think of it, my dad is also actually one of eight. And that's like, that's a lot of babies. Their third child, however, his name was William. He was born in 1914 and unfortunately he passed away when he was just six years old in 1920 to pneumonia. The other children were Marie. She was their eldest child and in 1929 when all of this happened, she was 17 years old. Their oldest son was Arthur. He was 16. Carrie was 12. There was Maybelle who was seven. James who was four. Raymond who was two. And then they also had a three month old daughter named Mary Lou. In 1918, the Lawsons moved from Lawsonville. I mean, understandably, because I wouldn't want to be living in Fioryville. <laughs> they moved to a place called Germantown because Charlie's younger brothers, Marion and Elijah, had moved there a few years earlier. And he just wanted to be closer to them. He wanted to be close to family. And when they first moved to Germantown, they worked as sharecroppers. So the Lawson family was actually, they were tobacco farmers. So they were working class people. They had to work as sharecroppers for quite a while while they saved some money of their own. And sharecropping is basically like when one person owns all of this land and then they would let a bunch of other people use their land to grow crops on. And then in exchange, they would get some of their crops that these people who were using their farmland produced. And then by 1927, the Lawson family managed to save up enough coin that they could buy their own farm, which was right next to his brother's. So it was a wonderful little location for them. And it was located on Brook Cove Road. Charlie Lawson was said to be really well respected in his community. They were a pretty well liked family and by all accounts they were just like a super normal working class family. In the evenings Charlie, Fanny and their two eldest children 17 year old Marie and a 16 year old Arthur would spend their time renovating the farmhouse and then one day while removing some rotten timber Charlie had a little bit of an accident, bumped his head with an axe and you know he gave himself a pretty good bop and apparently he was like a, just a completely different person after this so before this happened he had a little bit of a temper every now and again and then afterwards apparently this just like got a lot worse after this and like everyone noticed like people in the community his neighbors and his family all noticed this change in his personality and he just like had a really hot head so two years later, it's 1929 now, and two weeks before Christmas, Charlie decides to take his family out to Winston-Salem, which was about 20 kilometers away from where they lived. And he was just bawling there. He told them, hey, look, get whatever you want, get some nice new clothes, go crazy. And he did this, like, even though they did not have the money to be doing this, they did not have the money to be going crazy, buying nice fancy clothes and saying, go get whatever you want. You know, like back then, this was just a massive luxury. It's not something that the working class person would sometimes get to do even in their entire lifetime. And then on top of that, he also went and got a family portrait of the family, which again was like a massive luxury. It's not something that a lot of people of his class would do back then. It was just really weird and they were all wearing like their fancy new clothes that they'd bought that day and just the fact that he went out and he was like, you know, going crazy with his money just two weeks before everything happened, I think just kind of goes to show that this was definitely pre-planned, that he knew that he was going to be causing a ruckus later on. And because he knew that he was going to be causing a ruckus, he was just spending all this money because he knew it didn't matter in the long run. And on top of that, he also told his family that this big day where they were spending all this money was part of a big Christmas surprise. If that's not sketchy considering what happened later, then I don't know what is. 
Also, this portrait in itself is really weird. Like, everyone just looks super pissed off and uncomfortable. Literally, nobody looks happy. Marie, who's 17 years old here, literally looks like the cameraman has insulted her or called her ugly or something. Like, she looks pissed. Charlie is the only one who looks like maybe a little smug. He's got like this smirk on his face or whatever. And this is really the only notable thing that happens before Christmas. So let's jump forward to the 25th of December. In the morning, Marie wakes up nice and early so that she can get started on making this two layer cake with like icing on each layer. And she puts some little raisins on it for some festivities that they had planned later on in the evening with their aunts and uncles. And they were gonna have a nice Christmas dinner together. 16 year old Arthur and his dad Charlie were gonna go out rabbit hunting that day as well because I think this is like a Christmas tradition that they had and not just them I think a lot of people in this town have that Christmas tradition because I know that his uncle and his auntie and their families also went rabbit hunting on the same day It just seemed to be something that they did on Christmas Hunting rabbits not my cup of tea, but to each their own while Arthur's getting ready to go and he's getting everything gathered up, he realizes, damn, I've got no bullets. And he's like to his dad, Charlie, do you have any bullets? And Charlie's like, I don't have any bullets. You should go into town and you should go and get some bullets. And he sent him away to go and get some ammunition from the town. And just a little PS, Charlie did, definitely did have some bullets. So I don't know whether he like sent Arthur away because he didn't want Arthur to be involved or there was also some speculation that he thought that Arthur might be able to intervene and stop him from doing what he was going to do but either way it seems like he definitely didn't want Arthur involved and that's why he specifically sent just Arthur away into town so that he wouldn't be there when everything went down. But anyway while Arthur is in town Charlie just goes absolutely nuts and murders his entire family. Didn't really seem to be any rhyme or reason to the way that he did it. He shot some, he bludgeoned some, to some he did a little combo of both. His two middle girls, Carrie and Mabel, were gonna go to their aunt and uncle's house to wish them a Merry Christmas. And in order to get to their aunt and uncle's house, they had to walk past the tobacco barn, which was on the property. It wasn't the main house, it was like a separate little barn that they had. Little do they know, their father Charlie is actually waiting in the tobacco barn for them. He's lying there and then as soon as they get close enough, he shoots them both. And then he goes out, wants to make sure they're dead, he bludgeons them, and then he drags their bodies and lays them down in the tobacco barn. He then goes back to the main house and 37 year old Fanny is just sitting on the porch, innocently peeling some potatoes, and all of the sudden, he just shoots her in the chest. He then reloads his shotgun and swings the door open to the main living area of the house where Marie and his two youngest sons, four-year-old James and two-year-old Raymond are. And these boys are four and two years old and they just heard their father shoot their mother and swing the door open with a big shotgun. They are freaking out and they run to hide. And as they run away to hide, Charlie unloads his shotgun into Marie's chest and she slumps to the ground in front of the fireplace. He then goes and finds the two boys, he shoots both of them and then bludgeons both of them after shooting them. And then finally he went up to Mary Lou. She was in her crib and she was literally three months old. Three months old! Innocently, powerlessly sitting in her crib and he bludgeoned her to death. Her cause of death was a fractured skull. Like literally this guy is such a monster. To not only murder your entire family, but to bludgeon a three month old baby to death. Like you have to be seriously messed up in the head. And nobody knows why he even did all of this. Like there's been a little bit of speculation, but we'll get into that later. So after he finishes the murder spree, he poses all of the seven bodies in the living room. He puts their arms across their chest as if like they were laying in a casket, like in a funeral position and then he uses rocks and places them underneath their heads as pillows. He then went into the woods by himself and he was there for several hours just like pacing around and around and around. Charlie's brother Elijah and his two sons were actually the first ones to discover the whole scene. They were coming over on their way home from rabbit hunting to wish them a Merry Christmas and they got there, they saw everything and they were just like holy shit what happened. Because like I said rabbit hunting was like a Christmas tradition in that town so hearing gunshots really was nothing out of the ordinary, nobody would have thought it was anything other than rabbit hunting which come to think of it is probably why Charlie chose to do this on Christmas Day so that nobody would be suspicious of the gunshots. 
And that's exactly why nobody discovered what had happened until they came over just to wish them a Merry Christmas. They first came across Maybelle and Carrie in the tobacco barn and then they went into the main house, discovered the rest of the bodies, but they couldn't find Charlie anywhere because as I mentioned, he had gone into the forest by himself. Word spread really fast and immediately everybody is pissed. The police, neighbors, everybody from the town is at the house and they're searching for Charlie. Arthur was still in town when all of this happened trying to buy ammunition and somebody had to come into town, tell him what had happened, drive him back to the property where he was also trying to find his dad and figure out what was going on and what happened. As everybody's looking for Charlie, they hear the sound of a single shotgun go off deep in the woods. He had been there in the woods for hours and hours, just pacing around and around and around this singular tree until eventually he killed himself. After these two shots go off, I saw a couple of differing reports about what happened here. There were some reports that the Beagles were already in the forest with Charlie and they were just howling and police and people from the town managed to track these howls and find Charlie that way. And then there were also some other reports that they followed the two Beagles into the forest and that's how they found Charlie. Either way, when they got there, it was December 25th. There was a lot of snow everywhere. And so they could see that there was this really deep little circular path around a dogwood tree that showed that Charlie had just been pacing around and around and around this tree. They also found two notes in Charlie's pockets which had been scribbled on little tobacco auction receipts and these were like really weird little notes because they were unfinished which is just like so weird to me. I know there's a lot of weird shit in this case but like I just found it so bizarre that he didn't finish the notes. Like was he just thinking on paper or what was going on? I mean clearly there was something whack going on in his mind so maybe like that's why he didn't finish them because his mind was just going a million miles a minute. I have no idea. Anyway, the notes read trouble can cause and then the other one said nobody to blame but. As I mentioned, there was a lot of snow. So the Lawson's family farm was like located on a bit of a hill. So it was a little bit difficult for them to be able to transport the bodies down to the hearses to then transport them to have autopsies and be embalmed. Family, friends and police had to use like borrowed bed sheets to wrap the bodies up and kind of make them into like a makeshift sled to get them down to the hearses on the main road. Originally they took the bodies to a funeral home in Walnut Cove but this funeral home was just not big enough to be able to deal with doing the autopsies of eight bodies because like there's a thousand people in the town. How often are you going to have eight people dying all at once? My bet would be not that often. So they packed the bodies back up, put them back into the hearses, and then transferred them to Madison Yeaton's funeral parlor on Murphy Street. Dr. C.J. Hasselbeck was the Stokes County coroner at the time, and he was the one who conducted the autopsies on Christmas night. And he did this with a man named Dr. Spotswood Taylor. He was home for the holidays. He actually worked at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, and he was the brother of the sheriff of the town. So he and Hasselbeck worked until the early hours of the next morning, Looking at the bodies and they decided to remove Charlie's brain for examination to figure out like all right what's going on here there's got to be something messed up in his brain to have made him do this they put the head in a jar of preserved formaldehyde and then Taylor took it back with him to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore because they just had a lot more resources to do a proper and more thorough examination of the brain. They found that his brain was a little bit small and the center part of it was a little bit maybe underdeveloped but nothing like abnormal to explain why he may have done something like this. There were no injuries or anything from his little axe incident that he had two years prior, like nothing that could explain the murders. The entire family was buried in the same plot so they were all buried alongside the man who murdered them which I just think is so messed up. And while eight bodies were embalmed at Madison Yilton's funeral parlor, only seven caskets were buried because three-month-old Mary Lou was laid to rest nestled in the arms of her mother Fanny. Over 5,000 people attended the family's funerals because word spread really quickly about the case and people just went nuts for it. They could not believe it. Like I said, Charlie was a well-respected guy in the community. People liked the law sins and they just could not wrap their head around something like this happening. People traveled into town for the funeral and apparently there were cars parked for four kilometers and like that's a lot of cars. 
people were packed in like sardines at the cemetery just trying to get a glimpse of what happened like it was just wild these people were also interested in what had happened that after the funeral at the cemetery the Lawson family farm was only a couple of kilometers away so they would go there to see the scene of the crime they wanted to see all the blood and everything because nothing had been cleaned up and this gave Charlie's brother Marion a bit of an idea and I definitely think this was like a selfish idea I definitely think he was taking some profits but his excuse was well little 16 year old Arthur the only surviving member of the Lawson family he needs some money to pay for the mortgage so we're gonna start charging people to come and see the house within 10 days of the murder he had securely fenced the whole farm off and he started running ads in the newspaper to say come and see the scene of the crime for 25 cents a person and he turned his family's murders into a tourist attraction. But he would get like 500 people coming to see the house or something ridiculous like that. And even a guy named John Dillinger came to see the house. He was like a famous mob star and he'd escaped from prison. And then like right after escaping prison, he and his girlfriend and one of his little mobster friends made a stop at Germington on their way to Florida to see the house. And apparently while he was there, he left a note on the door of an area lawman in Germington and he was just like, mocking him for missing America's Worst Wanted Man. All the blood was still at the house and nothing had been cleaned up. The crib was still there with all of baby Mary Lou's blood in it. The cake that Marie had baked that day was also still there. And people decided that they wanted to start taking little souvenirs of this horrible crime. It sounds so morbid when you think about it, but I feel like as a society, we have always been interested in morbid stuff like this. Like people used to go and watch public executions. People used to go to the Coliseum in the tens of thousands to watch people literally get ripped alive by lions. And I mean, I feel like that's still a thing today, just not so barbaric. Like we'll watch a case like this, for instance, of me telling you all about it, which is less barbaric, but it's like along those same lines. But anyway, like I said, people were taking souvenirs. There was one person that actually came with a little jar and literally scooped up some of Fanny's blood from the front porch as a souvenir. The dogwood tree that Charlie had like done his pacings around had been almost stripped bare of all of the bark. People were taking bricks from the fireplace. They were taking raisins from Marie's cake. Like Marion actually had to encase the cake in glass so that people would stop taking all the raisins from it. And then at the end of January in 1930, all of the family's belongings were also auctioned off to the public. And the crowds like went nuts for the murder weapons. The murder weapons apparently went for a lot of money. The shotguns that he used to murder the family were sold off and apparently they just went for like crazy amounts of money. There was like a little tent show exhibition, like a little fair and surprise, surprise, Marion decided to set up a little store showing memorabilia of the Lawson family murders. They took the bloody crib there, they took pieces of furniture to this fair, Apparently they took Marion's cake there and some of the murder weapons used to show off for people to come and see and have a little look at. In 1945, Arthur was 31 years old and he died in a freak truck accident leaving behind four children and his wife, which I just think is so unfortunate. Like such an unfortunate way to die and such an unlucky way to die after being the only surviving member of a family that had been massacred. Eventually after the tour stopped, the Lawson family house was demolished and Charlie's brother Marion actually buried the cake at the site of the house. And now apparently the site where the house once was is apparently haunted. People have claimed to see Charlie's ghost walking through the forest. They've claimed to see the ghosts of the children at the property. Apparently in autumn, leaves fall everywhere except for that little circular area around the tree where Charlie shot himself. And it's also said that when it snows, it snows everywhere except on Charlie Lawson's headstone. Madison Yilton's funeral home where the autopsies and embalmings took place is now called Madison Dry Goods in downtown Madison. The owners Richard and Kathy Miller actually restored the upstairs mortuary rooms with like period furnishings and also historic memorabilia from the actual mortuary service of the Lawsons. They have the embalming table, palm straw fans, caskets and they also have photos of the Lawsons there that they like sell signed copies of. And this I find so crazy but they actually still have the same elevator that was used to transport the Lawson bodies 
this up to the second floor for their mortuary services and it still works. There have been books, poems, and even songs written about this whole thing. Like there's a song that's available on Spotify and YouTube and it's called The Murder of the Lawson Family by Carolina Buddies. And I can just not imagine them writing, like sitting down and writing this. And then looking back at it and being like, yeah, this is not messed up at all. Yeah. Yeah, let's sing this. Let's record it. Just, just jam into people's deaths. Just in case I get um, demonetized for including the music, let's just, um, it was long last Christmas evening. The snow was on the ground. <laughs> This is not even how the song goes, like tune-wise. His name was Charlie Lawson and he had a loving wife, but they never knew what caused him to take his family's life. They said he killed his wife at first while the little one did cry, please papa won't you spare us, how hard it is to die. But the raging man could not be stopped, he would not heed their call, he kept on firing fatal shots and there he killed them off. Surely you would have said and there he killed them all. Right? That would have sounded better. So there's a couple of theories as to why Charlie would have done this because nobody actually knows why he just randomly snapped one day. The first theory is that he didn't murder his family and that it was just posed to look like a murder-suicide. Apparently he had witnessed an organized crime incident and then the people committing the crime noticed that he saw the crime and then they killed him and his whole family and like set it up to look like a murder-suicide. Which, I mean, I just think this holds no weight at all, especially considering the way he acted just two weeks prior to the whole murders. I feel like that alone is evidence enough that he had pre-planned this whole thing. There's another theory that he might have had like a medical condition, like maybe he had something wrong with his brain because of the axe incident that he'd had two years prior, but again, nothing was found on his brain, so I really don't think this holds much weight. Another theory that, again, I don't think holds much weight, but I think it's interesting to tell you guys all the theories anyway, but another theory is that he had a painful growth on his chest and he was just over it and decided to kill himself and decided to just take the rest of his family with him. And now the last theory. This one is definitely the most plausible. It's definitely the most widely believed. It's what I think is what happened. But apparently Charlie forced himself on his daughter Marie and she fell pregnant with his child. This theory actually didn't come out until 1990 when a book called White Christmas Bloody Christmas came out. The author of this book interviewed a relative of the family named Stella Lawson and Stella was the daughter of Jetty Lawson who was Charlie's sister. Stella apparently claims that she heard her mother and like a bunch of the other aunts and uncles talking about how Fanny had come to them and said look I think that Charlie is having an incestuous relationship with Marie. And Jetty Lawson actually passed away in 1928 which means if this was true Fanny would have known about the incestuous relationship for over a year before the murders happened. Another book called The Meaning of Our Tears was published in 2006 by the same author and in this book he interviews one of Marie's close friends named Ella May. Ella May said that her and Marie were having a sleepover with a couple of their other friends and apparently at the sleepover Marie told them that she was pregnant with Charlie's child and that Charlie and Fanny both knew about it. Another close friend and neighbor of the family named Sam Hill also said in an interview that he knew of some major problems that were going on in the family because Charlie had forced himself on Marie and told Marie that if he told anybody that there would be some killing done. And like in the family portrait from two weeks before the murder you can't see Marie's stomach but she looks pissed. Everybody looks pissed. But that is all of the information that I have on this case. As always, I would love to talk about what you guys think about the case in the comments down below. And hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.